session. This conference so, will now be recorded. Great. So everyone who couldn't join us, uh, they can have the chance and possibility to join to see the, the recording later. Okay, uh, let's go through some basic rules on uh, how you should join this webinar and the interaction uh, of the webinar itself. So make sure to join through um, Wi-Fi and uh, through maybe a desktop. It's better for uh, the stability of, uh, of the webinar itself. Please mute your mic if you are not uh, speaking, but if you have a question and you want to interrupt me in any, uh, in any time, you can. Uh, I will also view the chat once we start, I cannot view it in real time, unfortunately, as I will be explaining some, some concepts, but um, you can just drop your questions and concerns in the chat and I will try to, to take a look every 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, this is an active workshop, so I would really love for all of you guys to, 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 to just uh, express all your questions and concerns in the chat. I will try to reply to all of them. And if you want to speak and ask a question, I'll be more than happy to clarify all your doubts. As I always say in all our uh, webinars and workshops that we do at Pearson Professional, there, there are no wrong questions. So um, I believe, I strongly believe there is only knowledge upgrade. So please ask whatever the question might be. And the session will be, of course, recorded, so whomever did not join us can have the possibility to do so. Now, who am I? Um, my name is Loredana Manushacha. I'm the lead technical instructor for Pearson Professional. Uh, I'm based in Dubai. I come from a digital transformation background. I worked for uh, several years for a conglomerate, a B2B conglomerate, Teleperformance, for two very important clients, uh, being Apple and Sky in Europe. Uh, from an academic background, um, I just finished my Master of Science in Blockchain Applications and Digital Currencies. I'm currently concluding my MicroMasters from Rochester Institute of Technology in managing complex projects and uh, regarding innovation and technology. I'm a blockchain certified um, architect and I've been pretty much involved in the um, sphere of startups and um, mentoring uh, new projects in, uh, in Dubai mainly. So I was a mentor for Startup Bootcamp for a while. Uh, I was mentoring startups into one of the biggest um, conferences happening in Middle East being a STEP conference. And some of my papers that I've published with um, some colleagues uh, during my master's thesis and everything are published in Research Gate. So feel free to take a look. Uh, and I'm really excited to, to give this webinar amongst all other webinars um, for, uh, for Pearson Professional because I strongly believe there is value to deliver to our community and you should always be learning and upgrading your knowledge. So what will we dwell in today? Uh, our webinar objectives will go from demystifying fintech, but we will stop just a little bit here. So uh, we will kind of review what's included in the umbrella of fintech and why is it so buzzed? So what is what is it so special about fintech? Uh, we will see the evolution of money and we will make the connection um, of the evolution of money with blockchain, explaining how does blockchain uh, relate to Bitcoin, to cryptocurrencies, how did blockchain come into, into the picture and why is it's so hyped and, and important to financial services. We need to know why why we need why is, why is blockchain so special, right? Because we keep hearing about it on our daily basis. So I will start by asking everyone, and maybe you can um, cooperate with me in the chat. Do you think you have interacted at all with fintech during your lifetime? Do, do you think fintech is part of your life already? Okay, Sheila, yes. So if you think of fintech um, as, as a technology, as, as, as a concept, as an industry, how would you classify it? So what, what does it really stand for, first of all? What, what is fintech? So the acronym itself, it stands for financial technology, right? So it's every, um, it's technology powering the financial services or the financial industry as a whole, right? Is it a product? Is it a service? Or is it a business model? The answer would be that it's actually all of them. Cryptocurrencies, and, and if you have heard of Bitcoin, are actually a product of fintech. Services, remittance services done digitally, are actually a service of, uh, of fintech, are included as a service. Business models, crowdfunding, um, 
collecting money from different sources of, of, of people uh, is actually one method of, of a business model. So it, it's a business model included into fintech. So you might think that maybe you haven't interacted with, with fintech, but actually you have. Fintech, it, it's not just a buzzword it has already penetrated your lives, right? If you have ever made a purchase via Apple Pay or if you have ever paid digitally for anything in your life, then congratulations because you are part of FinTech, of the FinTech industry. If you have ever sent money home through an app, through an SMS even, uh, these is, the SMS technology is more common in less developed countries, but we nowadays use more apps, right, with the penetration of smartphones and everything. If you have ever purchased insurance online or applied for a credit card or a loan online without going to a branch or to a bank, then congratulations, because fintech is already part of your lives, right? So th this is just in terms of giving fintech uh, not just the buzzword and living it like that, but giving it a, a form. We, we shape the acronym in what fintech stands for. Now, in terms of what does fintech cover by itself, this is a very broad concept, actually. So uh, today we're going to actually um, take a focus into blockchain and crypto, most, mostly. But I will go into each of uh, one of these areas to explain a little bit what, what the concept might be. And um, this is one of the umbrellas taken from one of the CB Insights fintech reports that I I find it the most complete ones, but if you do a little bit of research, there's plenty of, of research materials done out there and reports where you can delve into the uh, concept of what fintech really covers, right? So when we think of all the financial services and all the financial industries, we have several subsections, right? We have lending, for example. If you're doing lending digitally, if you're doing lending through a marketplace, that's fintech. Every company that is using blockchain or cryptocurrencies, which we will explain in detail a little bit in, in the upcoming slides, uh, all the companies leveraging blockchain technologies and using cryptocurrencies in the financial industry, they're also part of fintech. Regtech, on the other side, uh, can be uh, anything that includes compliance and regulatory and being compliant as a company with, with uh, the authorities of a country, right? So audit, fraud, risk, um, risk management, regulatory compliance, software, due diligence, evaluation of companies, all of these steps are included in the Regtech part. Personal finance, all the tools to manage bills, to pay for, for your credit, to pay for, uh, track your personal finances. Uh, we have plenty of, of online apps today from banks mostly being offered that are included into the fintech side because you can pay multiple uh, bills through that applications. And it somehow clashes with the payments and billing because we have applications that also provide uh, an aggregation of all the bills that you have to pay. So you can connect your personal finance with the payments and billings that you have to do. And by payments, I mean what I um, mentioned before, being Apple Pay, Alipay, Google Pay, every company today is kind of dwelling into the fintech space because they see potential in it eventually. Um, insurance. Insurance is a very tricky one. Um, it's also called InsurTech. Um, it's technology that is powering the insurance um, markets, but um, why do I say tricky? Financial uh, industry is very regulated as such, but insurance is what, that one subsection which is even more regulated. It is very highly regulated. So somehow, um, not too many technologies are, apply, are applied to the InsurTech side, but Lately, this has been changing. So everything that regards in data analytics, aggregators, websites that can figure out the best insurance for you um, or uh, connect you to re, uh, insurance on, uh, to insurers online or several companies or uh, somehow aggregate all the options that you have and in the end just filter out for you all the work that you would be doing in case you would go uh, to to take a look at all these companies by itself this is all data analytics and this is all machine learning algorithms on the background of, of a platform as such trying to trying to find the best uh, the best thing for you um when we come to capital markets um 
here we we might include all the analysis done all the trading that is done online uh, all the tools and financial institutions that are using uh, digital tools to interact with their customers and then when we go to wealth management we have something uh, really cool that is called robo advisors uh, is one of the examples of course wealth management wealth tech is, is is a very very broad concept and we would need actually a, a quiet several few webinars to explain each one of these subsections. But we do go into detail into each one of these in our FinTech Navigator course. So uh, one example in wealth mentioned would be the analytics tools, uh, the robo-advisors um, that kind of um, help people to manage their portfolios and kind of help you to make uh, wise investment decisions the same way as people, right? Money transfer and remittances, sorry, money transfer and remittances is a very big one because remittances market is a multi-billion market and um, it has lacked innovation in the uh, in the past couple of years because uh, MoneyGram, Western Union, all of these remittance companies that we know have somehow become monopolies, right? But now that smartphone penetration and the internet and with everything that has come through uh, in terms of technologies, remittances is facing, remittances market is, is facing a very big disruption. So anything that you might um, uh, that you might try to do money transfers and remittances online through an application or sending money through companies that charge less fees than the traditional ones, um, these are all innovations that are powering the remittances market and of course are part of the fintech umbrella. Mortgage and real estate. Uh, again, uh, this would uh, be shaped uh, into the word pop tech. So um, it has been buzzing a little bit in the last past, past years, and it kind of uh, revolves around uh, technology powering marketplaces uh, regarding real estate, how you sell real estate, how you interact with tenants, how do you pay your mortgage of the house. Um, it clashes a little bit with the lending and and um, uh, mortgage, of course, is lending to, to buy or real estate. So digitization of, of this kind of industry has been difficult to do, but there are plenty of startups out there that have managed to, um, to innovate in the real estate market. And it's really interesting. We delve into a couple of case studies in our FinTech Navigator course to understand better uh, how each one of these subsections work. But for the scope of this webinar and FinTech Umbrella, it's a very big one. We're, today, we are going to focus especially into the blockchain and crypto one. And in order to understand how blockchain and cryptocurrencies came into the picture and how do they connect with the FinTech world and what kind of disruption they really bring into the picture, we need to first understand how payments are done. We need to understand how we came up to this day. So what's the evolution behind the financial industry in terms of money, money issuance. We need to understand what's the difference between a digital, a digital money and virtual money. You might think it's the same because um, every time maybe they might be used interchangeably, but actually they're two different things and we're going to dwell in a little bit into that. Before I move on, um, any question so far? Can you hear me? Elizabeth was saying that we can't hear you. I can hear you now, all right. Thank you, Laurie. Okay, great. Great. Okay, uh, Mohammed, you've sent the question in private. Okay, we'll keep it, we'll keep it for, for later. I'm just reading into the chat. We'll keep it for later and I'll go through all the questions and we'll reply uh, regarding also the hospitality industry, okay? Uh, okay, great. Finish, Lurie, thank you. Okay, great. So let's delve into the evolution of money. How did we come here? You might think that FinTech is actually a new buzzword because we have been hearing about it in the last couple of but it's actually a very old concept if you think about it. Uh, what has changed during the years, it's actually the way that we look at technology. Today, when we mention technology, we think of uh, the, the internet era, we think of artificial intelligence, we think of blockchain, and we think of big data, cloud computing, and many, many other um, technologies. But 
to be completely frank with you, financial technology, in my opinion, has always existed. And I always give this example, and it's a good example to, to kind of get into the, into the essence of the slides. So uh, how did money evolve over time, right? We had barter trades, right? When people were to exchange things with things and we had no technology at the time as such. Um, and then we evolved into uh, gold coins, silver coins, metal coins. And I want you to think about it. What about the technology used to produce these coins? So you needed a machinery, let's say, that would make the same shape of these coins. It would make the same coin identical for, uh, for it to be, to be uh, equal to all the other coins produced and at the time this type of machinery was actually the technology used so we we could somehow call this fintech because it was powering how money was made uh, regardless of what money was was it coins was it gold was it uh, silver etc etc and then we moved into paper money right and you have all the years of um, of the movement in terms of evolution and the paper money uh, if you think about it so uh, Governments invested a lot into getting this machinery where they would print money in this particular way that is not easily counterfeited. The paper of which money is made is actually a special paper to produce the paper, to find the paper, to do all the magnetic strips in, in, in um, uh, the small uh, transparent strips that you see in every, in every type of paper money issued by a government. All of this requires a special technology. And this is also FinTech at the time, just the machinery used to present and to, to, to produce the paper money. And then we, we passed on to um, credit cards, debit cards, and just the producing of the, the chip itself in our cards or the magnetic strips, it's the same. And then we came to what we call today FinTech FinTech being mobile money and, and digital transactions until 2008 where Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency, gets introduced. And we got introduced to what we call virtual money, right? We'll see that in the next slide. What I want you to take away from this slide is that Financial technology has always existed. It's just the mentality and the mindset of people um, on how we view technology, on how we view this, this powering of the financial industry through technology. So this will change with time, right? Today, we see technology as what I mentioned. What, what do you think would happen after 50 years? We might have some other disruptive wow technology that we would consider as the new step of technology powering the financial industry. And AI, blockchain, and all these other technologies might seem irrelevant for the time that we would be living in. So fintech is somehow always existing. It's just evolving in terms of concept and evolution, of course. So if we make a distinct um, difference between digital currency and virtual currency, and yes, there is a difference there. And there is a difference also with cryptocurrency, but that I will explain when we come to explaining the Bitcoin and how, how does it work. So digital currency is actually simply currency issued by a bank in digital form. It has always existed. When you pay with your Apple Pay and uh, you register your card inside the app and everything, that's digital currency. I mean, a bank can, uh, can, can interact and do the settlements and at the end of the day, at the end of the week, they can choose. And because this is a centralized operation, um, it's, it's, it's somehow controlled by the central bank or the banks that are included in the entire process. So digital currency has always existed there since they started issuing uh, digital currency. Now, the virtual currency is another type of currency, is the unregulated one. So it's not issued from a government, but it's a currency that only exists virtually. So it only exists online. Digital currency can also have a representation in terms of coins, in terms of paper money. So it's the same. It's, it's, it's issued by the same government and authority. The virtual currency exists only online. And this is actually where cryptocurrencies fall into under the virtual currency um, definition and concept. But the particular thing that cryptocurrencies have is that they are not just virtual currency. They are virtual currency but with a technology that powers them on the background which is cryptography so uh, we are talking about another level of the scale being um, being uh, uh, 
So you, you go up with a scale, right? We will not dwell into the technicalities of, of how Bitcoin works and hashing algorithm and the protocol and everything into this webinar because it's not the scope. This is a general webinar for you to get uh, acquainted with, 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 uh, with blockchain technology. But in the FinTech Navigator course that, that we offer, uh, we dwell a lot in the te technicalities uh, of how blockchain works, how the protocol works, how the, the currencies are issued. We make a lot of different in between different uh, protocols and what they bring into the picture. So we kind of deep dive into the concept. Now, in order, I'll just stay in this slide for a second. In order for you to understand how payments are done on a blockchain ledger and to kind of give you a, a preview in order to understand better what the concept is about, we would need to know how does a payment of uh, X dollars, in my next slide, I've taken an example of $100, is being processed. If you have never gone through this, this, this kind of flowchart, or if you have never been curious to, to kind of delve into it, um, this is, let's say, a flowchart of how payments are performed today. Now, take a very close look about how how many steps do we have here and take a very close look about how many intermediaries we have right so from the customer when he pays for a product or service with a credit or debit card that kind of interaction passes to the payment processing service provider right this post machines that you tap your card into or you put your card into they send the information to the card network you might have heard visa uh, Union Pay, uh, MasterCard. This is the card network, right? Now, the this, uh, this network sends the information to the association, to the issuing bank of the merchant, right? Now, the issuing bank of the card, sorry. Now, this institution goes and interacts with the acquiring bank of the merchant. And then the card network gets involved again. And this is all happening in a matter of seconds, but just take a look at the steps. Now, this slide, with this slide, I didn't want to, uh, you to only get the, the part that there are a couple of intermediaries in there involved. But I, I went a little bit above. And if we take $100, so I'm the consumer, I go to a merchant, and I want to do $100 purchase of X thing. In step one, two, three, four, five, there are verifications being made. At the moment that the transaction is, uh, is confirmed and approved from this bank here in step number five, there are $2.20 being retained from that $100. Passing on to the card network, the card network has to confirm there's another 13 cents being taken from the money. And then if the banks, the issuing bank and the acquiring bank are different, there's another 19 cents being taken from that bank. And then the PSP, payment service provider, takes 23 cents out of that. The merchant in the end is left with $97.25. And if you think about it, this item that you bought, um, the merchant is calculating all this that he has to pay to everyone. So actually it's the consumer who paid all of this. It's not the merchant. The consumer always pays, guys. We are, we are the victims in this case. So the merchant has calculated his profit in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this scheme. He has calculated everything that he needs to pay to the PSP, to the card network, to the bank, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is the entire process that happens. Now, for just $100, the fees can go up to 3.3%. And this is taken from uh, Bloomberg and Glenn Book uh, Partners uh, source. It can go from, from 2.75 to 3.3 only for $100. Now, just imagine how, how much fees would you have to pay if you were to move a million dollars? What do you think that could be? I mean, it could be thousands of dollars. It can be thousands, right? that the bank and the card network and everyone else needs to take as, uh, let's say, um, a measure for taking the risk, in parentheses, of doing all of these transactions for the consumer. So the, the main takeaway is that the higher the sum that you are interacting with as a consumer, as an investor, whatever your position might be, the higher the fees that you have to pay. Now, if we take the same, um, the same scheme, 
and we apply it to blockchain. Now, blockchain technology, um, I will explain a little bit how um, a, a background history, just for you to understand how we came to, to this point. So in 2008, there was a white paper being issued from someone called Satoshi Nakamoto, who later disappeared. It can be one person, it can be a group, no one knows for sure. And he released um, what he called peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, and he called it Bitcoin. So in the white paper, he explained how this uh, new currency, he called it currency, um, would work. He explained the protocol and he explained the technology behind this new uh, behind this new currency as a, or this electronic cash that um, the acronym that that he used for it. Now the technology behind it is precisely blockchain. So blockchain uh, was introduced into the market as the technology who is as the ledger of Bitcoin. So it's actually recording all the financial transactions that are happening with this particular cryptocurrency. Later on, the concept um, evolved a lot. And today we have several blockchains, we have different blockchains, and blockchain is actually uh, falling under what we call distributed ledger technologies. So um, I'll explain a little bit about that in our next slide. But before I dwell into that, okay, I can see you, you still can't hear me. Is it okay now? No, it's okay now. Okay, great. Maybe it's a problem of GoToMeeting or my network. You never know. Okay. So in order to understand how blockchain works, let's go through the same scheme of when you want to do a transaction. So we saw how this happens with the conventional world, right? Now let's see how this works with blockchain. Let's say we need to do a transaction, right? So you, uh, you are, um, you are. I want to send money to someone. I'll send money to Elizabeth in this case, and I want to sell, send her a hundred dollars. In this uh, ledger that we are talking about, let's take the Bitcoin for example. I want to send her a hundred dollars equivalent of Bitcoin because inside the blockchain, inside this ledger, you can interact only with the native currency of the ledger, right? So I request a transaction. And I broadcast it to all the nodes. Now, I don't want to dwell a lot into the technicalities, but think of a node just as a computer. So there are these people spread decentralized all over the world who they have this computer, this full node of the entire ledger that, get up, uh, that gets upgraded in real time. Now, the network and not some central authority, remember from the first scheme. So you needed to go through the bank and the process was completely centralized, right? You, the bank needs to confirm the card network. So there's centralization in whatever we see in the previous scheme. Here, it's the network itself that needs to, um, to approve the transaction that I want to do. So the network is just 51% of all the people that are involved in this network. So if it's 10 people, it needs to be six people in order for my transaction to be validated. So once my transaction is validated, it's added to a block. It's called the blockchain because this is just few blocks being chained together, full of transactions. Now, the block itself has a certain size in megabytes, and when it gets full, the block gets added to the chain. This is why it's called a blockchain. Duh. <laughs> so um, at the moment that my transaction gets, uh, gets done, uh, it gets added to a block, and this block gets added to a chain, right? And then the money gets sent to Elizabeth or to whomever is. Now, if you're wondering where are the fees in all of this, uh, you pay small fees to the network participants. So the person who mined the block, who was confirming the transaction and who mined that block, we will talk about a lot about mining. I don't want to confuse you right now, but mining is a very special part of, uh, of the protocol of, of blockchain as, as a whole. So uh, the person who mined this particular block is the person who gets the transaction fees, right? Because he took the time to review the transaction, that I have the money, etc. cetera. So, uh, once the block is confirmed, it just gets added to the chain and the authenticity and transparency of the chain just goes on. And my transaction is confirmed. Now, this is a very high level explanation of blockchain. There are a couple of technicalities behind it that, that we would need to explain in order to understand it better. But to give you a, a very uh, simple example, think of the blockchain as a notebook. 
I always use this example. It's a notebook and the entire ledger is this notebook. Uh, the pages are just blocks and every single transaction that gets performed, it's, it's just one single transaction on the ledger. Now, just to give to blockchain certain features, it's just a public ledger, so anyone can review it. So if I send $100 to Elizabeth, Bitcoin, in Bitcoin, worth of Bitcoin, in the blockchain, uh, Bitcoin blockchain network, uh, there is this ledger, blockchain.com, for example, where I can see the transaction itself. And everyone can see it, actually. It's all about the transparency, and it's all about making publicly available these transactions, right? Append-only features. Why is, has blockchain uh, made such a big uh, disruption in, in, uh, and is such a big buzzword? Uh, now, it started in the financial industries, right? Because uh, once you do a transaction, there is not um, the feature that we call a chargeback with cards, for example. You cannot go back to do a chargeback in the blocks because only to change one transaction into one block all the blocks are chained with each other. You would need to go and change all the past 10 years, 11 years, 12 years of activity of the entire chain of blocks in order to change only one thing on the blockchain. And this is what makes it hard uh, to, to tamper with. And this is what makes it immutable. So it's, it's a very good tool to be used from companies, from, from financial companies in this in this. Um, in this case, to record transactions, right? So you can just add data to it. You cannot edit or delete. So this makes it immutable. It's another very good feature that is being. Now, what are the benefits and drawbacks? And um, is it good that, that um, it's always immutable and things like that? We discuss them a lot in, in one of the workshops of the FinTech Navigator course. We go into details into um, explaining what's the benefits of centralization, what's the benefits of decentralization in this case, and is it really worth it to, to give up your privacy in order to have that kind of uh, simplicity and, and um, killer apps in terms of centralization, etc. So these are all concepts that we, we kind of deep dive in the course. Now, as I said, it's decentralized, so it doesn't it doesn't exist on one computer. And in order for you to hack it or to to do to tamper or to do something with blockchain, you would need to hack at the same time millions of computers around the globe. It's practically impossible to get um, if a hacker or or some malevolent uh, people or or someone would need to tamper with with the blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain in this case. I'm always talking about the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, the original godfather of, uh, of, of blockchain, um, you would need to actually uh, change the entire chain and you would need to take over 51% of the entire uh, nodes that are, are actually on the blockchain, that are approving. Uh, and by nodes, I need computers. Can you hack millions of computers around the globe at the same time and change all the chains and everything? It's practically impossible. This is what makes it um, uh, so, so, so good to, to interact with. And you don't need to trust anyone. So no one has any uh, malevolent, malevolent um, need to do something bad because everyone gets rewarded. There's an incentivation program for the, um, for the people who we call miners who take care of approving all the transactions. And you don't actually need to trust anyone, right? Um, they call it trustworthy, but uh, it's actually an oxymoron because in blockchain, you don't actually need to trust anyone. You just trust the network. You just trust statistics, mathematics. You just trust numbers. You just trust the algorithms underlying this kind of network. Now, um, blockchain first came into the picture um, with Bitcoin. So as the ledger recording the Bitcoin transactions being made on it, uh, but it does not only uh, go uh, into financial transactions. Now, the big buzz, what happened on blockchain is that um, if you think of everything that we interact daily, an image or a file, a document or um, uh, a certification or whatever it might be, just think of the opportunities and possibilities that you might have to record transactions, not only financial transactions. Right, but every kind of transactions that might happen on a daily life can be recorded on the blockchain. Now, um, 
the term blockchain is mostly referred to as the decentralized public one, but we do have um, uh, permissioned blockchains, which are actually called distributed ledger technologies. And we do the difference between uh, different types of, of blockchains and the uh, DLTs in our course. We dwell mm -hmm. into what blockchain uh, brought into the picture and why industries, big tech industries uh, are using it and how they are using it. For example, Amazon got several patents for blockchain. <laughs> IBM is using its supply chain um, in the supply chain management of, uh, of coffee or of lettuce or to track records of what's happening. If you need to record and track a lifetime of something, that's that's the major, the, the big tool to be used. Now, as I always say, and this is my opinion, blockchain is not a panacea, what I call, it's not a solution to everything, but it's true that it has brought into the picture a lot of solutions that before was not even imaginable for many industries. So uh, I don't want you to think of blockchain as something that could solve everything and can record everything, but I want you to think of blockchain as a very powerful technology that has immense potential to grow and to be something more than just recording the financial transactions uh, made with cryptocurrencies. There's just one application of the blockchain. Okay, I'm just checking the chat in case you lost me again. I'll just check it every couple of minutes. Great, so th this should give you an idea of a, a very high level idea of how blockchain works. Now, um, if we were to dwell into the hashing algorithms and how does it really work, et cetera, we would need um, some hours of workshops and hands on, as I say. So. Um, we go into both our courses, the FinTech Navigator, and there's another blockchain course upcoming. We go deep dive into, into what I was theoretically talking in this webinar. So uh, we do transactions with cryptocurrencies. We, we see blockchain uh, as such as a ledger. And I took a screenshot just, um, uh, just a few days back of one transaction that got made, and I put it in the slides. So if you think of the transactions being made, uh, we go, going back to this kind of slide. So we had here something like 3.30 up to 3.30 fees being made only for $100. And we said that in order that uh, in order to transfer a million dollars, for example, you would need much more. You would need thousands of dollars in fees to be uh, attained from your bank. Now, uh, I'll just go here and I took a screenshot of the blockchain. Now, just look at that. And this is this is mind blowing. This is why uh, I, I literally love blockchain. Now, on January 2020, there was a transaction happening, confirmed transaction. This is uh, directly from the Explorer, um, the ledger, the blockchain ledger that records all the transactions made. Now, there was 125,946 Bitcoins being transferred okay from from one wallet to another wallet the price of the bitcoin at the time was at the time was appro approximately 8750 so that's 1.1 billion dollars worth in bitcoin being moved in couple of minutes the evening of 14th of january and guess how much this person who moved this this uh, this big amount of money uh, the fees were worth 83 dollars so this person paid to the network the fees of only $83 to move $1.1 billion. Impossible in any kind of imaginable scenario with the conventional finance, right? So this is this is exactly um, what, what I call the, the potential of this technology of moving cross-border money in the financial services industry. But again, keep in mind that blockchain is far more broader than just the financial services industry. So I explained a little bit how, how, how Bitcoin and blockchain works and everything. So I want to stop a little bit into what's happening now. Um, you must have heard of central bank digital currencies. You must have heard of stable coins. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I'll explain a little bit what's the difference between these because these are very um, common buzzwords. And um, it's one of the reasons actually why blockchain as a technology and cryptocurrencies took a very um, close attention from central banks and governments all around the world, right? Um, 
Bitcoin as such is a decentralized, uh, it doesn't belong to anyone. So it's a decentralized cryptocurrency. Uh, you cannot control its, um, its issuance. Actually, the protocol, the blockchain itself of the Bitcoin is set to only 21 million. So there will only be 21 million Bitcoins during the entire time. They just get mined and mined and mined day by day, right? Now, from Bitcoin, who was a public, it has a public ledger and everything, we passed on to stable coins. Uh, stable coins were uh, shape shifting of cryptocurrency, let's say. It, uh, they took the best of both worlds, being centralized world, so fiat money, and the decentralized world, cryptocurrencies, so currencies backed from cryptography, from technology. And companies started issuing the stable coins who were backed by fiat. So one tether, for example, and you can just Google it, and we talk a lot in the FinTech Navigator, one tether is worth one dollar. Now, from the stable coins, we reached to central bank digital currencies. And I'll explain a little bit about that through this image. Um, I don't know if you know Christine Lagarde. She was uh, ex-director of IMF, International Monetary Fund. And just recently, beginning of this year, December 2019, something like that, Christine Lagarde took over the European Central Bank. And she made her first conference. And um, this, one of, uh, this, this is one of those admirable women that um, kind of leave you without words. And she said, uh, European Central Bank, on her first conference as uh, taking over the, the ECB, the European Central Bank should be ahead of the curve on digital currency. So she was very prompt in starting to uh, build a task force, which should be ready by mid-2020 into building um, a European-backed digital currency, because they see um, the potential that there is in blockchain as a ledger and in taking the best of both worlds. So you take the centralized part of issuing currency and you take the digital virtual form of cryptocurrencies and you make something called central banks digital currencies now um, central banks are very ripe for change as i call it uh, because uh, if you can see lately also with the covid 19 situation everyone has gone a all on all this um, physical cash containing bacteria and transmitting diseases and governments and only and also countries saw a very very good potential in acquiring this type of technology and putting it into motion into um, what could happen in the future so if something like COVID-19 happens again uh, we're still not done with the situation but if it repeats in the future they want to be prepared for it so this is one of the main reasons that that uh, you should also know about blockchain and cryptocurrencies and how they work uh, into understanding how central banks in the future might issue the same thing and just lately, um, I, I was reading the news and everything, just lately, a couple of days ago, China released actually their first central bank uh, issued digital currency. So um, Chinese people in the future, they will transit slowly, slowly into just using a virtual money issued by a central bank. So um, as I said, uh, central bank digital currencies just take the best out of both worlds. Now, there are issues, benefits, advantages, disadvantages. We have cybersecurity and cyber risk to think about. We have plenty of um, protocol being matched with the monetary policy of a country. There are plenty of issues there, but we have several uh, very good discussions in our workshops discussing how uh, this could benefit a country. Is it a benefit or does it have its own disadvantages, et cetera, et cetera. And I think um, this was all about it. So um, I really hope you got a little bit uh, of the idea how blockchain and Bitcoin works, of uh, some of the reasons why uh, this is such a powerful technology. So if you can record uh, with transparency and uh, without and actually having to trust anyone, but just trusting mathematics and algorithms instead of trusting just people, and uh, I really hope you got something out of the webinar in terms of organizing your thoughts of what did you think before about blockchain and what do you think about blockchain and what do you think about its potential now, right? 
Uh, we will be starting uh, very soon our FinTech Navigator course, and we cover um, plenty of uh, workshops in the course regarding blockchain, into explaining all the technicalities, how it works, the protocol, into explaining different types of blockchains, into explaining how does blockchain, how is blockchain evolving over time, and how did we get here? We talk about very interesting concepts like tokenization and wealth distribution. These are uh, very, very good uh, examples to give in terms of the potential, again, of the technology. You, we use a, a very um, interested, interesting method called blended learning. So uh, you will have a, a full online course from APFL um, University in, um, in Switzerland, which covers everything what we spoke about. And then you'll have a couple of workshops being done online with me. Um, into deep diving in all the important topics that regard fintech and blockchain particularly. So as I mentioned priorly, um, we will have interactive hands-on workshops and there's also a fintech project involved. So you might uh, need to form a group at the beginning of, um, of the course and you would do some business planning on how to build really a fintech solution. And why not in the future, um, if you decide to, to, uh, to be an entrepreneur and, and go for it, you could apply Apply the business plan and you could build a platform a marketplace or whatever this solution of yours could be uh, and this has happened in the past we have several success stories who have taken the business plan um, out of the, the fintech navigator course and they have applied it in real life and um, uh, we'll, we'll also have a couple of uh, guest lecturers into um, into the workshops in trying to explain some some important concepts such as islamic finance or explaining uh, rec tech and through a startup and um, through uh, someone who has really done it in real life. So um, the workshops are, are built in that kind of way that we really uh, try to give the, the experience out of it because only learning and learning about the theory um, doesn't necessarily bring to uh, lead to action, right? But when you get the experience and when you get to do things with your own hands and you have the touch and feel of what is happening and you really understand what's the potential of the technology behind what you are doing, then it's a total different story. Okay, so um, feel free to, to message me or to message someone from DFC Academy or Pearson to, uh, to inquire more about the FinTech Navigator course. And I will take a look at your questions. Okay. Let me just... Okay, Mohammed, your first question I think was um, about the hospitality industry. Um, yeah, there are plenty of, of, of digital apps uh, being applied in, in hospitality. To be completely frank with you, and this is maybe my opinion, I haven't seen a lot of innovation in that, um, in that regard. I haven't seen a lot of digitalization when you think of it, but uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that um, in the future this will, will, will change a lot. But it, it somehow um, uh, it somehow fits into the prop tech, right? We will dwell into this. We, we go in, in analyzing each of the sections in the fintech navigator course into prop tech, for example, what is it included? Uh, how how can this be improved in the future? Uh, we have several uh, discussions, let's say, on 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 each one of them with case studies. So uh, we can we can dwell into that um, in the course itself. Okay. Okay, Sylvia, what is the transaction fees on the blockchain? See, um, Sylvia, that's a very interesting question. Uh, actually, the transaction fees depend because the blockchain is not a fixed, um, it's not just a fixed, uh, uh, let's say, ledger. So the, the transactions are, um, uh, or the transaction fees are fixed. They change with time because, uh, as we explain also in the course, the protocol itself adjusts the difficulty because the miners need to solve this particular issue when they mine a certain block. So they solve an algorithm and um, they find something called the NANS, etc. So I don't want to dwell a lot into the technicalities. Um, but 
But the idea is that the transaction fees vary. So they depend on the transaction size, on the weight and everything. So there are a couple of parameters that are measured in order to come up with the fees on the blockchain. But as I was saying, compared to traditional finance, these transaction fees are are just irrelevant. So you might be paying something like a dollar to move uh, thousands of dollars. And for 1.1 billion, we saw that we were paying, that the person that moves from one wallet to another was just paying $83. So compared to the traditional finance, it, it, it's, it's nothing actually. The fees, the, the blockchain fees are just paying the miners who have taken the time to be miners and to take care of the of the entire uh, ledger and to, to conform transactions they need to somehow get incentivized so this is why there is this incentivation um, uh, protocol let's say embedded into the blockchain itself okay uh, just a second okay which industry successfully applied fintech and blockchain in GCC? Um, I think we, we replied, Mohammed. Um, the question is, which industry successfully applied fintech and blockchain in GCC? There are plenty of applications, uh, fintech applications, uh, even in banking. Uh, I might just uh, just um, uh, mention one to you, just an example. Emirates MBD, for example, acquired a startup called Live, and they have uh, applied digital payments, and they have somehow built a, a Live app, for example, if you have used it in the past, that you can send money through social media, you can send money to um, uh, to your uh, to your loved ones, etc. So they have digitalized this part, and they have it's just part of Emirates MBD, but this part, the Live part, is just a, a startup that they acquired. So this is uh, one application of fintech, but there are many. I mean, um, in the fintech course, we go. Excuse me, uh, Miss Lori. Uh, yes. For the leave, you have said me that they have done a variety of transaction options. But my question is like, how Emirates and Bid is benefiting from this leave? Because we are, they are providing zero balance account. And what is the benefit of uh, Emirates and Bid? Um, that's a very good question, Mohammed. Uh, I would I would like to 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 discuss this by by saying, what do they actually gain from you having a current account now and not using your money? I mean, if you re reverse the question like this, it's just they gain customers. Banks live on customers, right? So um, even if from one customer to customers or the spendings that they have been doing, for example, in the Leave app, you have a, you have to maintain a 2,000 dirhams minimum spending. Now, banks um, innovate very carefully, I must say, but take the example of credit cards, for example. They will give you a credit card of 100,000 dirhams and they will say, okay, you might not spend anything. I will, I will not charge you anything. You will pay an annual fee. Has anyone not spend anything from a credit card? So um, it, it's a very tricky question and it's a very smart one, but uh, they do have to gain a lot from digitalization because they're losing customers. It's happening in UAE and the GCC is happening the same thing that happened in Europe and in UK. I don't know if you have heard of Monzo, of N26, of Revolut. Revolut is, is, is actually going to come to, uh, to UAE. This is digital banking being done. So digital banking in terms of FinTech, it's defying a lot the traditional banking. Customers are moving from traditional banking to go into digital banking Th I, think that Lori, we could go for a, I think Ms. Lori we could go for a personal discussion on this because this is a long topic <laughs> let's continue yes. with the remaining piece <laughs> it's a very long one I agree with you <laughs> <laughs> But, but we do discuss a lot about this and, and I love this kind of discussion because it's really what's what's about in our workshops. Uh, I really uh, love for, for all the students and professionals to think differently and to kind of defy themselves and the topic on hand so they can find solutions, you know, because when you think about it, there's a solution and there's an answer to anything. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you, okay, Ms. Thank you. Please carry Thank on. You a lot. Sure. Um, another question, uh, how can we connect fintech to uh, sustainability? Um, that's a very good topic, Mohammed. again. <laughs> they are very targeted. Now, um, 
I, I stumbled upon, I'll just give you one example. Um, I, I'm a very, um, I like to, to call myself a very sustainable person uh, in terms of um, uh, waste management and, and all of these things. Um, in my last module uh, during, uh, during my Master of Science in Blockchain Applications, um, there was this case study presented from one of my professors um, on uh, using blockchain to uh, incentivize people to, um, in, in less developed country, this was in Ghana or in Nigeria, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to incentivize people to clean beaches. So, um, or to clean the, the areas that, that were non-clean. So they were using blockchain to um, incentivize the people and give them cryptocurrencies back in order to track the usage of plastic and of uh, waste management, waste management industry. And they had partnered with a with couple of governments in, in some less developed countries because this is where, for example, the, the issue is is more, um, more pressing. So there are plenty of solutions made in sustainability also. Um, but uh, if you also think of blockchain strategy of, um, of Dubai, for example, I don't know if you have heard of it. We have a case study in the FinTech Navigator course. We uh, go and delve into what really Dubai is doing and what is their strategy. If you think of paper usage, for example, from governments, uh, just click online how much um, uh, paper would uh, Dubai uh, um, government um, save from using with the blockchain strategy, and it's billions. It's billions of paper usage, of cutting trees, of, of whatever you can think of, and Fintech, you might think that um, also banks use papers and all this uh, managing all the uh, KYCs and a lot of papers. So I find Fintech actually to be very well connected with sustainability. Um, we do also, this is also a very broad topic. I could talk about this all day, but we do also dwell. Ms. Gloria, into... excuse me. Yes. Excuse me, Ms. Gloria, I think we could go for a personal discussion after this. Sure. Okay, great. Okay, let me just go ahead with the questions then. Okay. General questions from Elizabeth. What problems are solved by blockchain which cannot be addressed by client server architecture? Um, very interesting one. Uh, I would just reply with a very simple uh, thing. Whatever needs uh, client server architecture is actually um, very related to the concept of centralization. So servers are centralized. Even today you have uh, laws and um, a lot of um, uh, regulations, let's say, where servers need to be in one particular country for that particular database. Um, the, the, the simple answer to this question would be that we need to find the difference between centralization and decentralization. What do you need to be out there and what do you need for, um, for the people to see transparently? So uh, you can, of course, uh, have uh, everything on a client server architecture. And in one of the workshops, we go very uh, deeply into analyzing, does an industry, does a company actually need blockchain? Because as I said, blockchain is not a panacea. And the fintech industry has somehow um, uh, overhyped it, but it's very good for people who went, go out of this course to analyze, do I really need blockchain? Is it something that I can do with just a distributed ledger? Is it something that client server architecture can do? So there are, this is also a very broad topic, but uh, you, you look at this from the centralization and decentralization part. Do you need your, uh, your project, your application, your, your platform to be decentralized, or do you need it centralized and governed by one entity, right? So um, this is somehow one simplified high level uh, answer about this. Okay, a lot of questions. Um, So will that increase in that of commercial transaction fees at any point? Uh, Sylvia, again, about the, the transactions of the blockchain fees, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, this changes, but it's not about increasing, actually. It will always be uh, re, um, according to what the algorithm calculates. So every 10 minutes, the difficulty of the blocks and of the uh, algorithm um, uh, being, uh, being solved, of the mathematical formula being solved, it just changes. It's not about increasing or decreasing 
it just changes to adapt the network and how many people are then on the network at the same time. So um, it's not something about just increasing and being thousands of dollars. As you saw, 1.1 billion was, was just transferred with, with $83. Tomorrow can be 90, can be 100 maybe. Or in the past, it has also uh, been 600 or 800. If we just dwell on, into blockchain a little bit into the transactions and their uh, fees, what, what is it charged? Um, it depends a lot on what, what transaction you are doing, right? So what's the transaction size in megabytes, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it, we, we come back to the same point. I just wanted to clarify, Loretna. Hi, Sylvia here. Uh, oh. When you were saying about the transaction fees, so you were saying that almost 3.75 is deducted in a, in a regular transaction. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it, uh, but in a blockchain, it actually differs from algorithm, right? So at any point, is this going to be more than three point seven three, say for a hundred dollars, because that can completely kind of defeats the purpose of using blockchain, right? True, true, very true. Thank you for your question, Sylvia. The idea is that today, blockchain and um, uh, it has some challenges. So uh, we talk about decentralization, but where would you get cryptocurrencies, for example? You have fees to pay in exchanges. Today, um, the concept that, that, that blockchain actually brought into the picture, the decentralization, uh, bigger wealth distribution concept, is not actually very much applied. This is the potential for the future. When you think about it, if you go now to buy some um, some um, some cryptocurrencies, you would need to pay fees to uh, to uh, the blockchain network for using the money. You would need to pay fees to exchange uh, providers. You would need to uh, pay fees to payment gateway providers because all of these elements from the conventional world have somehow been incorporated also in the crypto in the cryptocurrencies market. So. Um, we can discuss about this a lot, but the idea is that the true potential of blockchain and what it can offer, it's not yet being applied, as you said, because, um, because the concept is being defied from the trans transactional, uh, from the traditional banking, just taking over some of the parts of it. So uh, yeah, it makes sense. This, this kind of defies uh, what, what the blockchain was about, but the potential is still there. And um, today are mostly used the permission blockchains, let's say, the decentralized um, uh, blockchains are, are mainly used just to do some, some couple of transactions from consumers, but uh, companies being highly regulated, I would say they need to use something which is, is, is also regulated. So uh, how can you regulate decentralization, right? Um, we can discuss about it also in, in, in private. I don't want to, um, to just prolong myself a lot talking about this. What role does the government play with fintech compared to traditional bank are both subjected to same regulation with AML and regulation, ATIF? Very, very good question. Now, you see, um, as I said, um, regulation is trying to keep up. We have sandboxes in, um, in Dubai. We have sandboxes in every country. Every, um, every financial authority has tried to come up with definitions, regulators, uh, crypto custodians, crypto platforms, everything regarding cryptocurrency has been tried to be regulated. In US, for example, they are taxing miners and also in terms of taxation in other countries, Europe, etc. There are regulations being set, but that does not prohibit um, other people from using cryptocurrencies for um, not what they were intended to be used for, right? Um, there are several challenges, uh, and in the past there have been cases of uh, cryptocurrencies being used for other activities which are not legal, for illegal activities, but this is this is the point, right? We're, we're trying to make the world better, but illegal activities um, did exist even before of cryptocurrencies. So, uh, um, it's not that cryptocurrencies came into the picture and this is when all the legal uh, activities were being made. It's true that the anonymity of, uh, of Bitcoin, anonymity of cryptocurrencies, it's a little bit of a challenge, but most countries have issued regulations regarding this. So companies operating with cryptocurrencies, they're actually called uh, crypto uh, assets providers. Um, and there is an FATF uh, paper, the financial authority that regulates uh, most of the, the operations worldwide uh, that we actually uh, take into consideration the FATF um, 
report, we take it into consideration for a case study in our FinTech Navigator course, and we discuss what, what, are, what, are, what are the regulators doing right now and how is it proceeding with, uh, with regulating cryptocurrencies. But I do agree that it's, it's a very big challenge because um, the technology is it's very beautiful and it has a lot of potential, but it's also very frightening, right? Because you cannot, um, you cannot track something uh, that, that you don't know what it is. It works with wallets, right? You have private wallets. Uh, and, and we are not just two people transacting. We are just two numbers, random numbers transacting. So it kind of becomes very difficult for regulators in that sense, but they're trying to, to, to keep up with um, with all the regulations and the authorities are, are issuing papers after papers. Okay, uh, Yasin, what about challenges related to um, money laundering, funding terrorists? How can it be controlled with blockchain tech? Again, um, as I said, um, blockchain is a very powerful technology being used to track records of whatever is being done. Um, so I will give you one um, funding terrorists and money laundering is very big. I mean, um, uh, it has been used somehow for illegal activities in the past, but that does not um, somehow um, diminish the, the potential of the technology itself. Because, for example, um, there was a case that I stumbled upon. The diamond industry is using blockchain to track diamonds because there was a lot of corruption in the entire supply chain of diamonds, right? And um, uh, you can track something on the blockchain, uh, be it just lettuce, be it coffee, be it whatever you can think of a supply chain uh, from a supply chain management side, you can track things. And if you just onboard as a node all of your participants in the network, you can make a permissioned blockchain. I call it distributed ledger technology. It's not really a blockchain, but uh, it's just one step lower than blockchain uh, because blockchain is decentralized, public, and it's it, it's about the 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 transparency of it. But many companies, and when we talk about pharmaceutical, when we talk about uh, diamond control, control or, or many other companies who do business in one certain um, area, uh, they don't want private data to go out, right? Competition clause and everything. It's, it's a very broad topic to talk. But the idea is that you can use blockchain technology to track that um, um, that supply chain management of, of anything that you can think of, and you can make it half uh, permissioned and half uh, public. So it's a, it's an open but private ledger or public, uh, but uh, it has some features. So you can play with it. Uh, blockchain technology um, has has evolved with time. Today um, we have one of the most uh, used permissioned blockchains. DLTs again, um, which are uh, which is uh, Hyperledger, for example, and uh, IBM is using Hyperledger, for example, for its uh, supply chain management. You don't actually need cryptocurrencies to use the uh, Hyperledger in, in in its entire protocol, but you can make things a lot more transparent and a lot more faster if you just think of the transaction being made and one of the companies or regulators or whatever is one node in that entire network. Again. A very big and huge topic to discuss. We see um, Hyperledger and what is difference with uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, in uh, in the course. We have one of the um, half time of one of the workshops discussing precisely the differences between both, and how can both be used uh, beneficially. Okay. Um... There are so many questions, I actually lost track. <laughs> Sorry, just give me two seconds. Okay. So we clarified a little bit the challenge of the regulation. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. How can we apply FinTech in small and medium enterprises? Um, you, you mean in terms of startups, Mohammed? Like how can start startups leverage the the technology? If you can clarify. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Um, now fintech is is something that uh, not only the the big companies can use and can benefit. It, it actually everything actually starts with startups, right? If you think about it, and then the traditional elements of all, or the participants of uh, of the industry figure out that startups have found a better solution to do things, and then they think that they are ripe for change and they want to change things. So fintech actually has started in, in, in startups and um, 
I've seen plenty of, of uh, solutions being, uh, when I was mentoring in Startup Bootcamp here in Dubai, it's actually Startup Bootcamp FinTech. So they had a cohort, uh, they have every couple of months a cohort of FinTech startups that uh, are coming up with some amazing solutions. There are people uh, trying to um, uh, innovate into the insure tech industry, into the reg tech industry, trying to do due diligence uh, a lot faster. Some of them are actually trying to delve into smart contracts and trying to give the core uh, a better option of handling the, the long processes of, uh, of uh, judging uh, all the cases, etc. You cannot hear me. What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Apparently, some can hear me and some cannot. Let me just try change my network. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. So uh, the idea is that um, there's plenty of applications, Mohammed, not only from the startups perspective and small medium enterprises, but there's also a, a lot of uh, a lot of innovation to be done from the traditional companies. Now, um, what I think that uh, small and medium enterprises can use, it's not blockchain by itself in terms of, um, so you're a startup and then you somehow operate and you have revenue and you have uh, your business model ongoing, uh, it's important for small and medium enterprises to find marketplaces, to find investors, to find, there are plenty of steps to be taken, right? Uh, blockchain is just, is just not one technology that, um, how to rephrase it, it, it can, by itself, it's powerful, but if you combine it with other technologies, let's say AI, data analytics, and whatever you can think of, it becomes even more uh, powerful. So you can unleash the true power of, of the technology. So, um, Excuse me, Ms. Lurie. Yes. Yeah, but the, all these uh, things which you said right now, AI, all these things, for an SME, it is not possible. For an SME, yes. what will... Yeah, please. Yes, this was this was my point that kind of um, doing the technology all yourself, it's very expensive, right? If every startup or every uh, small and medium enterprises were to um, were to somehow use blockchain by themselves, they would need blockchain architects, they would need blockchain developers, they would need the technology development itself that costs. They can take blockchain as a service offered from big tech companies, which we discuss in our course, so uh, AWS or Microsoft. There are plenty mm -hmm. required patents precisely for that, and they can also leverage from marketplaces that empower the onboarding uh, marketplaces that for example uh, empower the onboarding of small and medium enterprises in order to find investors for example or small and medium enterprises to find suppliers there are plenty of marketplaces out there that kind of connect the the, the small and medium enterprises with one part of their supply chain that they need to be connected with but we learn a lot more and i prolonged the webinar by 20 uh, minutes i think we learn a lot more um from all of what i've been talking just to uh, multiply it by a thousand in our uh, fintech navigator course i really um invite you all to take a look at the content to discuss with elizabeth and meha who are uh, also participating in the in the webinar or someone from DFC Academy. Um, and if you if you really need um, to somehow have some some doubts or uh, in terms of technicalities, just feel free to 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 email them, and I'll make sure to to answer all the technical questions that you might have. And uh, thank you so much for attending the, the the webinar. Whomever I did not answer in full the 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 question, I really apologize. We discuss all of it in the course, and. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time on a Saturday precisely to, to join us and to have this interacting uh, this interactive uh, webinar. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, do some exercise, eat healthy, and I will um, see you all in maybe in our course or in some other webinars that we will do in the future. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Loredana. Welcome.